Hello, my online crew. Um, a lot of history is covered in today's article, and I just wanted to help you out and make a video of me reading the article to you, just in case you need an, an alternative source. We're gonna be hanging out here for a couple of days anyways, um, essentially breaking down what is in this article. And it does cover a lot of history. I know everything that we've done so far has been a lot of politics related. And what we wanna do is establish this knowledge about our country uh, the United States, that it's more than just politics. There's a lot of things going on at this particular time. And this article talks about the rise of, you know, the industrial Northeast. And as you'll start to see when we start comparing what's going on in the Northeast, comparing what's going on in the South, and we've already talked a little bit about the Northwest Territory, which allows our country to extend west. There are a variety of ways of life of people at this particular time. So without further ado, here is that article uh, for today's assignment uh, about the rise of the Northeast. So just starting out, here we go. The Industrial Northeast. The changing American econ economy reshaped life in the Northeast United States in the decade before, decades before the Civil War. Americans in the Northeast increasingly produced goods to sell, not just for themselves or for their family to use. Improved transportation made trade easier as it allowed producers in the Northeast to send their products or to send their goods to the rest of the country. Labor saving technology helped workers increase production. And that's very important right there. Changes to infrastructure. In the early 1800s, it was easier to export goods across the ocean to Europe than to sell goods in the United States. In 1816, for instance, American manufacturers could move one ton of goods across the Atlantic Ocean for $9, but only 30 miles across land. Towns and cities were loosely connected by a series of dirt roads, but they were in poor shape. Travelers would expect a long and very bumpy, uncomfortable journey. The United States was not all that united because travel between places was so difficult. Following the War of 1812, Americans rushed to build new national infrastructure. And you know, as defined in today's assignment, infrastructure is just pretty much stuff. What allows life to become easier? Like right now you're watching this video on an iPad. That's an example of infrastructure. But the infrastructure that we're talking about at this particular time is something like roads. Roads, canals, and railroads. Um, in his 1850, 1815 annual message to Congress, President James Madison stressed that the quote, great importance of establishing throughout our country the roads and canals which can be best executed under national authority. So right there, that, mess, that little statement for me signals a change in what our national government should do because there's nothing in our constitution that says, well, the national government should build highways and roads for the people. This is where learning about that uh, necessary and proper clause is pretty important because now we have a president that helped write the Federalist Papers that was essentially a Federalist until essentially the failure of Federalist policies like the Alien and Sedition Acts. Here is a guy that's calling for the national expansion of our government to build roads. Um, and that's, that's, that's pretty big. That's pretty significant. And it, you know, for me, that signals a shift into um, uh, our modern day society as well. Um, the national government doing things that go beyond the scope of our, con uh, of our constitution to benefit everyday people. So things to consider. Kentucky Senator Henry Clay also advocated strengthening the nation's infrastructure. His so-called American system supported a tariff 
to protect American businesses from foreign competitors and to finance the construction of roads and canals. Robert Fulton established the first commercial steamboat service up and down the Hudson River in New York in 1807. By 1830, steamboats filled the waters of the Mississippi and Ohio rivers, connecting the North and the South. In 1825, New York State completed the Erie Canal. This 350 mile long human made waterway linked the Great Lakes with the Hudson River and the Atlantic Ocean. Soon, canal boats were carrying crops grown in the Great Lakes region to eastern cities and returning with goods from emerging northeastern factories to sell to Midwestern farmers. The success of New York's, quote, artificial river launched a canal building boom. The United States' first long distance rail line launched from Maryland in 1827. Baltimore city government and their state government of Maryland provided half the funds for the new Baltimore and Ohio or the B&O Railroad Company. The B&O's founders envisioned the line as a means to transport farm goods from the Trans-Appalachian West to ports on the Chesapeake Bay. Philadelphia, Boston, New York City, and Charleston, South Carolina soon launched their own rail lines. State and local governments provided the money for the first railroads, but economic collapse following the Panic of 1837 eroded such support. Nevertheless, railroad construction continued. By 1860, Americans had laid more than 30,000 miles of track. So you can see here, if by 1860 we have 30,000 miles of train tracks and in 1825, you see this expansion of the Erie Canal. One thing that you should be thinking about is how should Americans get around? What is important? And more importantly, let's think about now. We have a very extensive highway system. Um, you can hop in a car right now in Wabash, Indiana, or some of you, you're in Florida, and we can find a spot on the map and we can meet there by car. So the reason why you want to think about this is, <laughs> one, you have this huge expansion of, of, of infrastructure going from a canal. We're using rivers. And now we're building railroads. And we are becoming more interconnected as a country. And, you know, connection is more than just transportation as we start thinking about the next uh, little paragraph here. The transportation revolution was followed by a communications revolution. The telegraph redefined the limits of human communication. By 1843, Samuel Morse had persuaded Congress to fund a 40-mile telegraph line stretching from Washington, D.C. to Baltimore, Maryland. So again, you know, interconnecting is, is infrastructure. Right now, me and you are literally connecting through what? The internet. The internet is a great example of connection, which again, thinking beyond what we're learning about here within this time frame, is what our country should do now. Should we have a national internet service? Hmm. Well, internet is something that people pay for now, but would it be necessary and proper to have a national internet service? These are things for us to consider. It's, it's very important um, because if you think about it, if you're in my online class, you absolutely need the internet to actually do this, right? Okay, well, let's think about that. You know, should, is it necessary and proper to have a national internet service? Things for Americans to consider. Northern industrial power. The market revolution caused American cities to grow, especially in the Northeast. In 1820, only New York City had only 100,000 inhabitants. By 1850, six American cities were that big, four of which were in the Northeast. New technology and infrastructure, such as the Erie Canal, paved the way for such growth. As early as the 1790s, merchants in New England began experimenting with ma machines to replace small workshops. Ooh, here we go. To make this happen, merchants and factory owners relied on the theft of British technological knowledge. In 1789, for instance, a textile mill in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, contracted 
21-year-old British immigrant Samuel Slater to build machinery. Slater had apprenticed in an English mill and copied the English equipment. In 1813, Francis Cabot Lowell and Paul Moody recreated the powered looms, powered looms used in the mills of Manchester, England. Lowell had spent two years in Britain observing and touring mills. Lowell also helped reorganize and centralize the American manufacturing process. Oh boy. A new approach, the Waltham Lowell system, created the textile mill that defined American industrialism before the Civil War. The modern American textile mill was born in the planned town of Lowell, Massachusetts in 1821, four years after Lowell himself died. Powered by the Merrimack River and operated by local farm girls, the Lowell Mill was, was the first modern American factory. Soon, 10,000 workers labored in Lowell alone. Working conditions were harsh for the desperate mill girls who worked in the factories from sunup to sundown. So a lot to break down here. Number one, we have a changing way of life. People, instead of growing things and making things for their own, they're now working in mills and producing things for the company to buy and sell. Well, who are they selling it to? Well, they're, they've got to have a, a base of population for people to buy and sell the products that are being made. And if you're looking at a textile mill, now you're looking at a way of changing life. People are no longer making their own clothes. They're now buying clothes that are made by somebody else. And if you think about that, that's saving people time. And what are they doing with that time? Well, in other parts of the world around this time, people are creating free time. I, I, as a fan of soccer, I know my favorite soccer team, Chelsea Football Club, was created in 1905. But that's all within 100 years of the expansion of industrialism where people, instead of just spending their days growing things and making things on their own and like kind of like the barter system, now they're working in a factory. Not only that, we have women working in factory, which, you know, for American history, you know, once, be, once women become empowered, they have the right to work now. It's only within 100 years that they're able to vote because you have to remember women at this time could not vote. So again, lots to break down here. Wage workers like the girls of Lowell faced low pay, long hours, and dangerous working conditions. Americans embarked on their industrial revolution with the expectation that all men could start their careers as wage workers and later run their own businesses. Wage work had traditionally been looked down on, considered suitable only for young men without resources. Children's magazines, such as Parley's Magazine, glorified the prospect of moving up the economic ladder for the immigrants and poorer Americans who dominated the wage working class. Such promises provided hope for a better life. This free labor ideology also provided many Northerners with a key sense, keen sense of superiority over the slave economy of the Southern states. So again, what we want to see here is that people in the North, they're very much going to work and producing things. And as they're doing that, people in the North are looking down at like North to South, looking down on the South. And that development of this idea of superiority is going to definitely influence the eventual end game of this particular class, which is the Civil War. So what we're getting into now is kind of the origins of why we even had a Civil War in the first place. It's like a difference in ideology. Yes, we're one country. And how did our country that was united before begin to like develop one side versus the other well here you go this is the start but the commercial economy often failed in its promise of social mobility depressions and downturns destroyed businesses even in times of prosperity unskilled workers might perpetually lack good wages and economic security and therefore had to depend 
on supplemental income from their wives and children. Now we're getting into the growth of slavery. By the early 19th century, states north of the Mason-Dixon line had taken steps to abolish slavery. Vermont included abolition, or getting rid of slavery, as a provision of its 1777 state constitution. Northern states passed laws that required slaveholders to end slavery gradually by banning the acquisition or the you know, buying of new enslaved persons while allowing slave, slave, slaveholders to keep their enslaved workers often as apprentices or people who are learning trade and they're doing that for free. In 1804, New Jersey became the last of the northern states to adopt gradual emancipation or freeing plans, freeing of slaves, pretty much what emancipation means. However, the rapid growth of the textile industry meant that the northern, northeastern economy relied on the increasing slave population in the south. Uh-oh. So again, textile mills process cotton, right? Okay, so where, did, where are they getting that cotton from? Well, it's tough to grow cotton in the Northeast, which is why it's a bit problematic when the South is continuing to have slaves. The population of enslaved persons grew from less than 700,000 in 1790 to more than 1.5 million in 1820. So slave population in the South essentially doubles within a 30 year period because of the amount of stuff that's being produced from southern grown cotton and who picks the cotton well it's slaves so oof, it's like a downward spiral you have this growing sense of superiority in the north but their superiority is essentially tied to the growth of slaves in the south oh inherent problems coming down the pike <clears throat> The growing demand for cotton to produce finished textile products in the Northeast influenced this growth in the population of enslaved persons. Eli Whitney's cotton gin further added to the expansion in the South. A simple hand crank device that, that quickly separates copper, cotton fibers from their seeds, the cotton gin allowed Southern planters to expand cotton production. So as more cotton is grown, they want to process it faster. And this is the worst thing about the cotton gin is that, you know, in theory, it might like limit slaves because one slave could do the work of a lot. Well, money, money drives a lot of human actions and that's pretty much it right there. The cotton gin with slaves, more slaves, more cotton could be produced, which that cotton is then sent up north to make the text to, to be processed in the textile mills. And as more people are going to the north from other countries, the increase in immigration. Um, at this time, immigrants were going right to work in factories. And it's, again, a very much a downward spiral that is going to have an impact on our country later on down the line. Southern planters could then send more cotton to Northeastern cotton mills, the growing textile market in the Northeast, then turn the cotton into finished products. These products could then be transported to markets throughout the United States and the world thanks to advances in transportation. And what we have here, that's a picture of the, uh, of the telegraph created by Samuel Morse. And now we're getting into immigration. More than 5 million immigrants arrived in the United States between 1820 and 1860. By the Civil War, nearly one out of every eight Americans had been born outside the United States. A series of push and pull factors drew immigrants to the United States. Real quick, push and pull. If you were in my geography class, um, well, you're in my class now, so I might as well talk about push and pull. A push factor is something that's going to push somebody away from their home country. Let's say that you know, at this time, this is one of the, uh, let's say that there's some sort of discord going on in another country. Uh, I know my family heritage is that I'm German, okay? So how did a German immigrant come over here? And more importantly, why? 
Well, Germany at this time was going through a little bit of political turmoil. Germany as the country that we know it essentially didn't unify until 1855. So a lot of German dissidents were pushed out of their country for some political reason. A poll, a poll is going to pull you into a, 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 a country. So let's say your life is good. Let's say you're English. Uh, you speak the language, but uh, your opportunities in England are limited because of just essentially social structures there, right? Okay, well, you can come to the United States and make your way here. Why is that? Well, the article already mentioned it. People would come to the factories with the intention of, hey, I'm going to learn this trade. I'm going to go to this factory. I'm going to work. I'm going to put my time in. And essentially, you see the birth of the American dream, that idea or ideal of people coming to the United States for the betterment of their lives. Oh, here we go. The article actually talks about a push factor. In England, Parliament created a push factor when it tried to modernize British agriculture by revoking land rights for Irish farmers. With their rights gone, the booming American economy pulled Irish immigrants toward ports along the east coast of the United States. Between 1820 and 1840, over 250,000 Irish immigrants arrived in the, United, in the United States. Irish immigration followed this pattern into the 1840s and 50s, where the infamous Irish potato famine pushed even more people out of Ireland. Between 1840 and 1860, 1 1.7 million Irish fled starvation in the oppressive English policies that accompanied it. That's definitely a push. To the Americans who were of primarily Protestant and British descent, the Irish immigrants seemed foreign and un-American, especially because many of them were of the Roman Catholic faith. As they entered manual labor positions in urban America's dirtiest and most dangerous occupations, Irish workers in northern cities were compared to African Americans and anti-immigrant newspapers portrayed them with ape-like features. Yikes. Again, um, how does this thing develop? Well, you know, there's always going to be a human issue with someone or something not like you. So as people come in, uh, the idea of, oh, we're already here and then immigrants are taking people's jobs, there's origins here. And then to compare them, with African Americans. Well, one, this implies that African Americans were already being mistreated. You can clearly see that with slavery. Um, yeah, not really very clean history here in terms of ideas. All right, moving on to labor movements. Many workers formed trade unions during the early Republic. Organizations such as the Philadelphia's Federal Society of Journeymen Cord Wainers and the Carpenters Union of Boston operated within specific industries in major American cities. These unions worked to protect the economic power of their members by creating closed shops, workplaces wherein employers could only hire union members, and striking to improve working conditions. Women textile work workers launched some of the earliest strikes. Textile workers in Lowell, Massachusetts, walked off their jobs in 1834 and 1836. During the 10-hour movement of the 1840s, female workers provided crucial support. Under the leadership of Sarah Bagley, thousands of mill girls signed petitions organized by the Lowell Female Labor Reform Association. The protection of child laborers gained more middle-class support than the protection of adult workers. In 1842, a petition from parents in Fall River, Massachusetts, a mill town employing a large number of children, asked the legislature for a law limiting the number of hours children could work. Massachusetts quickly passed a law prohibiting children under age 12 from working more than 10 hours a day. By the mid 19th century, every state in New England had similar laws. The sudden influx of immigration triggered the backlash among many native-born Anglo-Protestant Americans. The nativist movement 
especially fearful of the growing Roman Catholic presence, sought to limit immigration and prevent Catholics from establishing churches and schools. Popular in northern cities, nativism spawned its own political party in the 1850s. The American Party, more commonly known as the Know Nothing Party, succeeded in local and state elections. The party even nominated candidates for president in 1852 and 1856. The rapid rise of the Know Nothings slowed European immigration, and only after the Civil War would immigration levels surpass the number numbers of the 1840s and 1850s. So again, lots to break down here in this article. It goes from, uh, yes, it is talking about the rise of the industrial Northeast, but within that, you see a lot of things that we need to talk about. Um, number one, when it comes to labor movements, okay, people are going to factories, right? Okay, well, coming from that, the factories want to make as much money as possible, but the people working in the factories, if they're facing bad working conditions, there's going to be a bit of an issue there, right? Okay, so labor movements, definitely something that is up for discussion. Another point, immigration. As people are, you know, the rumor is that you go to the United States, you can get a job in a factory, you've got more room for opportunity. There's reasons for people to leave their home place anyways, right? So, all right, so we wanna to go to the United States, but even there, there's some issues because with the sudden influ influx or rise in immigration, you see a backlash among people that were born here. Okay, so that's a problem. You see a picture of the telegraph there. This is technology that's going to change the way people communicate, all right? Um, you see the reliance on Southern slavery. The Northeastern textile mills needed cotton to produce clothing, blankets, things made of cotton, right? So with the growth of slavery in the South, it's also problematic that Northern factories are essentially profiting off of that. And more people are beginning to profit off of it because people are working in factories. Um, oh, infrastructure, the roads, right? Wow. Uh, people getting around. It's really hard to go from Boston to New York City. So what's going to help that out? Well, let's improve the infrastructure like roads. Um, well, we've already got rivers. Let's make our own river. And that's what the Erie Canal is. Um, <laughs> there's a lot here. Um, so we're going to be hanging out in this article for a while. Um, hopefully you enjoyed this video about the rise of the Northeast. Um, if you have any questions about anything, please email me. And uh, our discussion question tomorrow is definitely going to be about infrastructure. Um, maybe not necessarily roads, but, you know, communication, internet. All right. So have a good one. Bye-bye.